Hey everybody, welcome back to General Biochemistry Lecture. We're covering Chapter 18, which is on amino acid oxidation and the production of urea. As always, here are the key principles for the chapter. Make sure that you read, the, read them over and that you can expand on them and you understand the concepts that you see throughout the chapter. This is an overview of amino acid catabolism in mammals. It's a really good figure if you want just a little something to jog your memory as you're kind of talking through the details of the chapter. We're literally going to cover everything on this slide except for the citric acid cycle because we already did that. So let's talk about the circumstances where we're going to oxidize amino acids. Oxidizing amino acids is going to degrade them. And we do that when amino acids are released during protein turnover and we don't need those amino acids to make new proteins. So protein turnover, it just means that you have a protein that is being degraded by a protease, that it's no longer needed, maybe it got damaged, that kind of thing. Another reason that you'll undergo oxidative degradation is that you've ingested amino acids, AKA you had something that has protein in it, and the amount of amino acids in that meal exceeds the body's needs for protein synthesis at the moment. Another reason is that cellular proteins are actually used as fuel when carbohydrates are unavailable or they're not able to be used properly. So think about some of the um, metabolism diseases that we've talked about where you can't use sugar properly. So under those circumstances, amino acids will also be used to supplement and make sure that the body is meeting its energy needs. With that, we're going to go ahead and get started with the first section here on metabolic fates of amino groups. So the amino group, the NH3 part, it can be reused. So it can be um, transferred from one amino acid to another, or it can be used to make other molecules that require nitrogen. But if that doesn't happen, then those amino groups are channeled into a single extra excretory end product, which is urea. We are ureotelic animals, which means that we make urea. There are other types of animals that uh, get rid of their nitrogen in different ways. We're not going to talk about that, but it is in your textbook and it is on some of the slides. But we're really going to focus on what uh, terrestrial vertebrates do. Sharks also uh, create urea as well. So this is a summary of the, you know, if you're interested in animals, again, this is us. We excrete ammonia, nitrogen as urea, but there are other ways that you can handle nitrogen. So glutamate, glutamine, alanine, and aspartate are most easily converted into citric acid cycle intermediates, and you can see these below. And this has to do with, you always have to transfer that amino group to something else, and then you may have to do a little bit of chemistry or rearranging, but you can very easily go from these amino acids to citric acid cycle intermediates, which will then help fuel the production of those universal electron donors, which will shuttle their electrons through the respiratory chain and ultimately help with the production of ATP. Let's talk about how dietary protein is degraded. So you have something, maybe you had a burger or something like that, protein. Degradation starts in the gastrointestinal tract. So yeah, you eat, you know, there's acid in your belly, but you really need um, enzymes to help break up those proteins. Gastrin is a hormone that's secreted when dietary protein enters your stomach. 
and that stimulates the secretion of the acid and pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is a zymogen, which means that it is an inactive form of a protein. And it's converted to its active form, pepsin, by autocatalytic cleavage at low pH. So you could see why the secretion of acid is necessary. Low pH comes from the HCl. Pepsin is going to cleave long polypeptide chains into smaller polypeptides. It is a protease. It's what they do. Then there's the hormone secretin, which is secreted into the blood in response to low pH in the small intestine, which the small intestine is like, oh, hey, I see what you're doing there, stomach. You're sending me something to work on. Gotcha. And that is going to stimulate the pancreas to secrete bicarbonate into the small intestine. That helps to neutralize things a bit. But it also does something else. It causes the pancreas to secrete zymogens of other, um, that are other proteases. So you want to have zymogens around versus having active proteases because they act on proteins. And they don't really care whether those proteins are functional in your body or part of the meal that you just ate. So there's another hormone that gets secreted into blood in, the res in, in response to peptides arriving in that small intestine. And it stimulates the secretion of all these other proteases that I was talking about. There's trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidases A and B. So all of those are zymogens that need to be cleaved in order to be activated and then they can go on and do their job. Enteropeptidase is a protease that converts trypsinogen to trypsin. So that activates a little bit of trypsin which will then go on and self-activate but it will also activate chymotrypsinogen and the procarboxypeptidases and some other uh, proteases as well. So it's kind of like a protease cascade. Once you get some trypsin going, then everything else is going to be activated. Now the pancreas is secreting all of these zymogens. And to make sure that we don't have any premature activation, the pancreas also secretes a trypsin inhibitor. And that inhibits the, the trypsin from becoming active prematurely in the pancreas and pretty much having the pancreas digest itself. That would be pretty terrible. The pancreas is responsible for secreting some pretty important stuff like insulin and these digestive proteins. So we're chewing up all of these proteases and we're making free amino acids. They are transported into epithelial cells that are lining the small intestine and they enter the bloodstream. Then they're going to travel to the liver. If you have acute pancreatitis, then what has happened is the zymogens that are responsible for digesting proteins, the dietary proteins, have become active earlier than that. And those proteases are attacking the pancreatic cells and pretty much eating away your pancreas. So it is for real bad news bears. Very, very painful. Certainly calls for a trip to the hospital to get treatment immediately. We're going to introduce a new coenzyme, pyridoxal phosphate. You will see it a lot when it comes to amino acid, um, anything that has to do with amino acids in chemistry. Amino transferases will use this cofactor for transamination. And that's pretty much 
taking the amino group from an amino acid and putting it on something else. The enzymes that do this are called aminotransferases. You'll also see them called transaminases. They're the same thing. And they remove that alpha amino group. So the amino group that's part of the backbone of every single amino acid can be removed in this manner. Cells contain different types of amino transferases that differ in their specificity for the amino acid that they actually work on. And a lot of them are specific for alpha ketoglutarate as the amino group acceptor. So you have to have something to put that amino group onto. Alpha ketoglutarate should sound familiar because it is a citric acid cycle intermediate. So it moonlights as, you know, a receiver of amino groups. In doing this reaction, you're going to take an amino acid, which again, that depends on the specificity of the amino transferase. And using PLP, you're going to transfer the amino group to the alpha ketoglutarate and make glutamate. And then you have the resulting alpha keto acid, which no longer has that amino group, but instead has a ketone. So this is a more formal definition of the transamination reaction. You're going to transfer that alpha amino group to the alpha carbon of alpha ketoglutarate making the alpha keto acid analog of the amino acid. This reaction is actually freely reversible, and we're going to see that amino groups can just kind of be thrown around pretty easily. You can effectively collect all the amino groups from all the amino acids in the form of L-glutamate so that you have one molecule that you need to deal with to ship out all of your unwanted amino groups. PLP is the abbreviation for pyridoxal phosphate and it's the coenzyme form of vitamin B6. So those B vitamins are very important. This is a prosthetic group that is used by all amino transferases and it carries the amino groups at the active site. So it will actually the amino acid transfers the amino group to the PLP. I'm not going to ask you to memorize the, you know, the structure of PLP, but you will need to be able to draw some structures and some draw a mechanism. I'll provide for you what the cofactors look like, but you'll have to be able to push the electrons around. So in its pyridoxal phosphate form, it's got a ketone here. When the amino acid transfers its amino group, that's where it attaches. So PLP is actually covalently linked through a shift base. And we've seen shift bases before when we we're talking about glycolysis. So again, the shift base is linked to the epsilon amino group of a lysine residue. Epsilon amino group just means it's the amino group that's part of the R group in lysine. The nitrogen is going to attack this carbon here and it's going to form that shift base. And you can see in this, in these two images of an active site, in this first one, the purple is the lysine residue and it is attached to the PLP. As an intermediate step, this is the free lysine and this is the PLP intermediate where you've got um, 
the amine attached. So you can do a lot of different chemistry with PLP, and we're going to look at that. So these are some of the reactions that are facilitated by PLP. There's transamination, which I want you to know. And we'll walk through that in just a second. There's racemization, which just means that you can take the L form and make the D form and vice versa. You don't need to worry about that one. Know that it's there, but that's certainly not the focus. You can actually also do decarboxylation. And I want you to be able to know this one too. So this table is going to be helpful for you when you're drawing out these mechanisms because it shows you the different intermediates that you can form when you have an amino acid come in and replace that lysine in an interaction with the PLP molecule. Particularly for decarboxylation, this chart will be handy because you can see the different resonance structures that allow for stabilization of the carbanion that's formed to um, allow for decarboxylation. This should look a little bit familiar because we've done decarboxylation reactions before. So that should be a bit familiar to you. I will go through the transamination reaction a little bit, but I expect you to be able to push the electrons with the help of this table. So we're starting off in the form where we have our enzyme attached to the PLP through the shift base, and then we have an amino acid bind. Doesn't matter what the amino acid is because we're just talking about this amino group here and all of the amino acids have that amino group. The only one that doesn't is proline, and proline is just special. But anyway, what's going to happen is you're going to form an external aldamine with the substrate. So that means that it's no longer the PLP will be attached to the substrate, not the lysine that's part of the enzyme. And that happens you form a linkage here. So that nitrogen ends up replacing this nitrogen here in this double bond. You abstract a proton and you create what's called the quinonoid um, intermediate. Quinones are just, you know, it's a, it's a chemical compound and they're pretty much electron sinks. So that's why PLP is so good for this kind of reaction and for decarboxylation and things like that. Because you can delocalize electrons from a, a substrate to form an intermediate to do some chemistry. And then once you've rearranged things, you can donate those electrons back. And then you have your new molecule. So once you rearrange, then you can hydrolyze the shift base and form that alpha keto acid. So when you hydrolyze, you're going to be attacking this carbon here. And you're going to free it from that shift base. And then you can just have the lysine go in from the enzyme and attack once more with the nitrogen to form your enzyme again. So know that one for sure. Practice drawing it. Make sure that the chemistry makes sense. I'm not going to spend the time to go through decarboxylation because it is very similar to what we've already done. It's just with a different coenzyme. So glutamate, as I already said, is really important for transporting amino groups to the liver where it can deliver its amino group as ammonia and the liver will take care of it from there. So the ammonium in mitochondria comes from lots of different alpha amino acids in the form of that amino group on L-glutamate. 
There's also the amide nitrogen of glutamine. So those are the two sources of ammonia, ammonium ion in mitochondria. We're not going to worry too much about um, what you see here on the right in terms of trying to understand all of the mechanisms here. But know that all of the glutamine and glutamate that's created in other cells, the extra hepatic cells, meaning everything outside of the liver, gets transported to the liver. And then from there, the liver decides, okay, well, maybe we'll make some alpha ketoglutarate and then we'll put some of these amino groups on some amino acids or we'll make some pyruvate or we'll make some urea. You know, the liver knows what to do. So, of course, we need to talk about the enzymes involved in these processes. There's L-glutamate dehydrogenase, and that catalyzes the oxidative deamination of glutamate to produce the ammonium ion and alpha-ketoglutarate. This enzyme is present in the mitochondrial matrix, and it doesn't really care whether or not it uses NAD or NADP, as long as it has one of these nicotinamide um, cofactors it's good to go. Alpha-ketoglutarate can then be used for the citric acid cycle or it can be used for glucose synthesis. Remember that oxidizing amino acids means that we're making fuel. So the body can make decisions about whether or not it needs more fuel and it can use that or it can go on and do something else. So glutamate dehydrogenase is a really important intersection between carbon and nitrogen metabolism. Since alpha-ketoglutarate can be used as fuel or serve as a glucose precursor in gluconeogenesis, it's a really important kind of fork in the road. Glutamate dehydrogenase is regulated by energy. Since alpha-ketoglutarate production is, you know, we don't want to waste that. We need to make sure that it's being produced when it will be helpful to the cell to make energy. So it's positively modulated by ADP because that signals low glucose levels. And we also know that it signals, um, you know, low energy in general. So if we're making glucose, if we are making more intermediates for the citric acid cycle will increase our ATP concentrations. This enzyme is also negatively modulated by GTP. And let's think about that for a second. Alpha-ketoglutarate is part of the citric acid cycle. And one of the things that occurs is we make GTP as a part of substrate level phosphorylation with the succinyl-CoA uh, dehydrogenase. So if we have a lot of that going on, that reaction, then we're going to have a lot of GTP, which means we don't have to do any more of this making alpha-ketoglutarate because we've got plenty of energy. I went backwards. Sometimes that happens. So glutamine transports ammonia in the bloodstream, just like glutamate can. And glutamine synthetase, synthetase means it requires ATP. It catalyzes the combination of free ammonia with glutamate to make that glutamine. You have to invest some energy, but it is a critical component to transporting ammonia to the liver. Free ammonia in the cell would be pretty bad news bears. So that's why it is very tightly controlled and it is delivered to the liver as part of a compound versus just free ammonia in the blood. We also have glutaminase or glutaminase and that catalyzes the conversion of glutamine to glutamate and ammonium ions. 
So that conversion also occurs. And once you have that free ammonium ion, that can be used in the production of urea. Again, this is happening in the liver. Alanine is also responsible for transporting ammonia from the muscles to the liver. So alanine, glutamate, and glutamine are important for transporting amino groups to the liver to be excreted ultimately as urea. So the liver makes the urea and then your kidneys are like, okay, we're going to put this out there. Get out of here, urea. So there are alanine amino transferases, which convert alanine and pyruvate via transamination using glutamate. So we've got alanine. We transfer that amino group to alpha-ketoglutarate to make glutamate, and we're left with pyruvate. That's called the glucose alanine cycle. So in your muscle, you've got muscle proteins, you make amino acids, and if your body doesn't want to reuse them or you just need to get rid of some um, 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 amino groups, then what's going to happen is you're going to make some glutamate you're going to take that glutamate and you're going to use the alanine amino transferase and you can make alanine which then gets shipped out into the blood and delivered to the liver once in the liver you're going to reverse all that you're going to use alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate and you've got pyruvate in the liver once you have pyruvate, then you can go through gluconeogenesis to make glucose and then secrete that, blood, that glucose into the blood to increase your blood glucose levels. That glucose gets taken up by the muscles because, hey, they need some energy, right? You make more pyruvate from that glucose and break it down and uh, you can see the cycle that you can take pyruvate and make alanine in the muscles and they can feed this whole cycle if you need to get rid of some amino groups then you can do that by again taking that glutamate freeing that nitrogen as ammonium and then the urea cycle So free ammonia is actually pretty toxic, really bad for the brain. Ammonium ions can compete with potassium for transport into astrocyte cells through the sodium potassium ATPase, and that results in an elevated extracellular concentration of potassium ions. So if that, if the sodium and potassium levels are askew, then that's really bad news bears when it comes to your neurons being able to fire. There's also a co-transporter that will transport sodium, potassium, and chloride ions. And the excess chloride from the excess, excess potassium ions alters neuronal responses to the neurotransmitter, the GABA neurotransmitter. So really bad. If you have defects in any part of your, you know, amino group removal system, we'll call it, then it can be really bad and it can affect your brain. It can affect um, your, um, your development. So we talked a lot about moving around these nitrogens. Now we need to talk about nitrogen excretion and the urea cycle. So the urea cycle is the pathway by which we take that ammonia and deposit it in the mitochondria of hepatocytes, so again, in the liver, and we convert it to urea. 
Then that urea enters the bloodstream and it's excreted in the urine thanks to the kidneys. Just like a lot of the other pathways that we've talked about, the enzymes that are required for this exist in metabolon. So they're clustered together so that the intermediates from the pathway don't have to travel very far. They can just go from enzyme to enzyme to enzyme and you don't have to worry so much about just pure diffusion getting the next intermediate to its final destination. The whole cycle is shown here on the right. We're going to go through it piece by piece. So urea is made from a five enzymatic step cycle. The first part of the cycle is using carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1. And we make carbamoyl phosphate from ammonium and carbon dioxide, which gets delivered as bicarbonate. We're investing two ATPs to do this, and it occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. So we are investing some heavy energy in urea creation because getting rid of ammonia is really, it's critical in survival. So it's worth investing the energy to get rid of it if it means that we're going to be overall more fit. So the first nitrogen enters from ammonia in this reaction. And this reaction uses two ATPs because there are two activation steps. The first activation step is activating the bicarbonate. So you use an ATP to do that. We've seen this before. So now that we have this carbonic phosphoric acid anhydride, ammonia can actually displace that phosphoryl group. So you can see how adding on the phosphate makes this chemistry go a lot better because we have an excellent leaving group. The lone pair in the ammonia will attack that uh, carbon, the carbonyl carbon, you say goodbye, phosphate, and now you have carbamate, which has this amino group here. Carbamate is then phosphorylated, and we make carbamoyl phosphate. So that's t the investment of two ATPs. You can imagine that this step is probably regulated because a lot of energy is used here. So that's one of the keys, key tells that you can kind of guess where things are going to be regulated. If there's a heavy energy investment at one step, it's probably going to be regulated. We'll talk about regulation in a second. So once we make that carbon oil phosphate, the next step is combining that with ornithine to make citrulline. To do that, we need the enzyme ornithine transcarbamoylase. Ornithine is not one of the traditional amino acids, but it is absolutely crucial in the urea cycle. So it doesn't really show up in proteins, but it is definitely necessary um, for life. Once we make that citrulline, it's going to pass from the mitochondria to the cytosol. So the urea cycle spans two different compartments, mitochondria and the cytosol. The next enzyme in the lineup is arginosuccinate synthetase, another synthetase. So that means more energy investment. We're going to catalyze the condensation of the amino group of aspartate and the ureto group of the citrulline to form arginosuccinate. This uses citrullyl AMP as an intermediate. And we don't see AMP used as frequently as a leaving group, but it is a good leaving group, just like the, um, the phosphoryl group is. 
you can see where we're blowing up kind of the, the different portions of the urea cycle. And I'm not requiring you to know this chemistry, but you should be able to recognize um, the different intermediates and kind of know where you are in the cycle. So you should be able to talk through the chemical logic of the urea cycle, but you don't have to draw it all the way out. So this is the reaction that we're talking about here. The second nitrogen enters from ammonia in this reaction. And we've got two activation steps, just like we did in the very first step when we made that carbamoyl phosphate. You've got ATP and citrulline. You're going to add on that AMP to make your citrullyl AMP intermediate. That means that you're going to cleave a pyrophosphate. And remember, that's usually cleaved right away by a pyrophosphatase. And that reaction provides energy to help offset the energy investment. Now that we've got the citrullyl AMP, we'll have the binding of aspartate. And the amino group is going to attack the carbon here that, is, um, that has the first am amino group added onto it. And the AMP is going to be your leaving group. So you now have... arginine and aspartate and they're or sorry arginosuccinate we've combined the aspartate if you take off the amino group from aspartate you make pretty much something that looks like succinate So that's why it's called arginosuccinate. The next enzyme, very aptly named, is arginosuccinase. And it catalyzes the reversible cleavage of arginosuccinate to form arginine and fumarate. Your brain may be going, man, I feel like some of these molecules I've heard of before. You have the citric acid cycle. So succinate, citric acid cycle intermediate. Fumarate, citric acid cycle intermediate. Trend here. The fumarate can be converted to malate, and it can join that pool of citric acid cycle intermediates. The arginine can go on to continue the journey to create urea. Now notice here in this um, figure, that the color coding tells you where the different carbons are coming from. So all of the carbons from aspartate end up in fumarate. The nitrogens and a carbon from the arginosuccinate are going to end up being urea. Arginase is the next enzyme in this pathway and it catalyzes the cleavage of arginine to form urea and ornithine. So urea has two amine groups and in the middle, there's a ketone. You should definitely recognize this molecule. That ornithine that we make is transported into the mitochondrial, mitochondria and it can initiate another round. Now, Stop and think to yourself, what other cycle have we seen before that kind of takes an intermediate and then adds some stuff to it and then breaks some stuff off of it and then we're back at the same place? Oh yeah, the citric acid cycle. You take oxaloacetate, you add on acetyl-CoA, you make citrate, and then 
you chop off some carbons, make some energy, and then you build it back up to get right back to oxaloacetate again. And you do the whole thing all over again. Cells are not necessarily original, but they are efficient. And if there's a process that works or a chemical strategy that works, they're going to use it every single way possible. So be able to draw some of those um, similarities out between the different pathways that will definitely help you when you're studying for the exam. So the citric acid and urea cycles can be linked. We're going to talk about how they're linked. But again, this is a good figure for talking through the logic. You can talk through the chemistry of the urea cycle and how that produces citric acid cycle intermediates and then how those intermediates get shuttled back into the mitochondria for use. Since we have all of this um, communication between the citric acid cycle and the urea cycle, transport between mitochondria and cytosol is key. So there are transporters that you have to have intact if you want these processes to talk to each other. So there's the malate alpha ketoglutarate transporter, the glutamate aspartate transporter, and the glutamate hydroxide transporter. All of these are key in making sure that the different intermediates can go back and forth between the cytosol and the mitochondrial matrix. There's what's called the aspartate arginosuccinate shunt. And these are the pathways that can link the citric acid cycle with the urea cycle. So it links the fate of all the amino groups with the carbon skeletons of the amino groups. The, this pathway is one of the two ways that you can actually introduce amino groups into biomolecules. The urea and citric acid cycles are really closely tied because there's a process that brings NADH in the form of reducing equivalents into the mitochondria. So that malate aspartate shuttle will kind of transfer the electrons that are in the cytosol to the mitochondria since you can't have NAD or NADH crossing over um, that inner membrane to get to the matrix. The urea cycle is regulated just like everything else. It's regulated at the level of enzyme synthesis for all of the urea cycle enzymes and that carbon oil phosphate synthetase 1. There's also allosteric re regulation of the carbamyl phosphatate synthetase 1 by N-acetylglutamate. Arginine will also indirectly stimulate activity of the carbamyl phosphate synthetase as well. So if we just isolated the urea cycle on its own, it requires four ATPs. That's a lot, okay? That's a big energetic cost. But because the urea cycle is linked with the citric acid cycle, that reduces the load, the energetic cost of the urea cycle because you're donating these electron donors to the electron transport chain because of the connection. So you're offsetting some of that energy cost by helping produce more. Remember, when we make NADH um, using that um, malate aspartate shuttle, one NADH is the equivalent of 2.5 ATP. So by being a part of that, we're contributing 2.5 ATPs, right? So again, the cost is high to keep the ammonia out of your body, but it's offset by the ability of feeding in citric acid cycle intermediates to help offset the, the energy cost. 
Genetic defects in the urea cycle, as I said earlier, can absolutely be life-threatening. So protein-free diets aren't really an option when you're dealing with this type of thing because there are essential amino acids that our body cannot synthesize. We have to get them from diets. And if you completely remove protein, then you're not getting those essential amino acids, which means that your body is hurting. All of your enzymes and all of those structural proteins and everything need all the gamut of amino acids to build properly. So what do you do? There are some treatments for urea cycle enzyme deficiencies. You can use benzoate, which is an aromatic acid. It's metabolized and it can combine with glycine. Phenylbutyrate is metabolized and it will combine with glutamine. We're not really going to go too heavy on the, the treatments, but just throwing it out there, by the way. So now we're moving on to the pathways of amino acid degradation. So we talked about how we get rid of the amino group that's through the urea cycle. But what about that carbon skeleton? What do we do with it? So amino acid catabolism does not account for a whole lot of our energy production. It's pretty low, 10 to 15 percent. The 20 catabolic pathways converge to form six major project products, which will ultimately enter the citric acid cycle. And they're listed here. We've already talked about how alanine can become pyruvate. We've also talked about how we can make alpha ketoglutarate by simply taking the amino group off of um, glutamate. We saw how we can make uh, succinate and fumarate. So there's we've already kind of seen bits and pieces of this, but we're going to go over it a little bit more formally. So this is something that you've seen before. Um, I believe this was in the chapter 19. Um, yeah, the chapter 19 video. Well, it came from chapter 18. We didn't cover it in order, so there you go. But this summarizes amino acid catabolism. And by no means do you need to memorize which amino acids are glucogenic and which are ketogenic, but you do need to know the difference and what it means in terms of what these skeletons will ultimately become. This is just showing you how and where all of these amino acids can feed into the different places along the citric acid cycle. So ketogenic amino acids can yield ketone bodies in the liver, and they're listed here. Remember, ketone bodies are not exactly the best in terms of energy production. We can end up doing some real damage to our tissues and our bodies, and we can have acidosis. Bad news bears, you don't want to rely on ketone bodies for energy. It's one of those last-ditch efforts. Then we have glucogenic amino acids, which can be converted to glucose, and that glucose can be converted to glycogen. Pretty much all the amino acids can do this, with the exceptions being lysine and leucine. Think about why that makes sense. So glucose is one of those molecules that provides energy. It's not harmful to the cell whereas the ketone body formation is, and processing those for energy is harmful. So it makes sense that all of the amino acids pretty much can become glucose and glycogen because that means that you're creating a fuel source that your body can readily use that will not harm you in the process. So we've got some more enzyme cofactors that play really important roles in amino acid catabolism. One carbon transfer usually involves one of the three cofactors listed here. Biotin we've already covered. We've seen that a few times. And it transfers 
one carbon units as carbon dioxide. There's also tetrahydrofolate, which transfers intermediate oxidation states. So CO2, that is fully oxidized. But what if you need something in between that? That's where you get uh, tetrahydrofolate. Then there's also S-adenosylmethionine. It's abbreviated SAM. It can also be abbreviated as ADOMET. Same thing. This transfers methyl groups. So we're going to look at all of these. I want you to recognize these molecules. We'll see them again. So tetrahydrofolate is actually synthesized in bacteria. Um, the oxidized form is folate. If you take a multivitamin or if you've ever taken a prenatal vitamin, you'll definitely see some kind of folic acid or folate derivative because it's actually very, very important to um, fetal development in the early stages before you even know that you're pregnant. So take a good prenatal vitamin. Um, and actually, there's no harm in men taking prenatal vitamins either. There's nothing, it's not going to like make you pregnant or anything crazy like that. But it's just a really good source of um, vitamins and minerals. So it's not a bad thing. I actually knew someone as a postdoc who her husband um, was resident at a hospital and they both took prenatal vitamins. Look, we, we buy one thing, we both take it and we're both healthy. So just throwing that out there. So now we're looking at S-adenosylmethionine, like I told you, ADOMET. You'll also see it abbreviated SAM. It's the preferred cofactor for transferring methyl groups. Its methyl group is super reactive, way more reactive than the methyl group of the N5 methyl tetrahydrofolate. There's methionine adenosyl transferase which catalyzes the synthesis of SAM from ATP and methionine. And then there's S-adenosyl homocysteine, which is formed when the methyl group from SAM is transferred to an acceptor. So it's like the intermediate. So this is the synthesis of methionine and, um, and SAM. I always call it SAM. Other people call it ADOMET. Again, same thing. I'm not requiring you to know this synthesis, but you can take a look at it and just kind of go, ooh, ah, look at some chemistry. So you need a methionine that's actually going to go and attack right here, this carbon, which is very unusual, quite honestly. You release all three of these phosphates, which ultimately ends up becoming, you know, just free phosphate. And you form this linkage where you've got this methyl group that was at the very end of methionine. It's now in this special position where it's next to this sulfur and that makes it much more highly reactive. So methyl transferases will use SAM to transfer one methyl group to something else. And you can see this a lot in um, like DNA methyl transferases and things like that where you're methylating DNA and that is a signal for um, changing the availability of the genetic information that's located on the histones that the DNA is wrapped around. We'll get to that. And we're going to see these cofactors again. Once you have that transfer, you're left with S-adenosyl homocysteine. And you can use water to hydrolyze off that adenosine. And then you're left with homocysteine. 
you can use um, a folate coenzyme with methionine synthase to reform methionine and you can do this whole process again. There's something called pernicious anemia which is observed in B12 um, deficient folks and it's actually traced to that methionine synthase reaction. You don't need to know this for the exam, but since we're talking about metabolism and all the metabolic diseases, you may encounter this stuff in medical school. So it'll be good for you to have already heard about it and have a little bit of the basis for it. So there are six amino acids that can be degraded to pyruvate. They're listed here and they're converted in whole or in part to pyruvate. That pyruvate is either converted to acetyl-CoA to be oxidized via the citric acid cycle, or it can be converted to oxaloacetate and enter gluconeogenesis. So this is just a figure showing how different amino acids can be degraded and what their products are. You do not need to memorize this but just know some of the different fates that you can make pyruvate, that you can you know, ultimately feed the citric acid cycle, things of that nature. We'll talk about a few more enzymes and I'll let you know what you need to know in terms of you know, knowing mechanisms. So there's serine dehydratase and that catalyzes the conversion of serine to pyruvate. It's going to remove the beta hydroxyl and the alpha amino group. So we're going to do a transamination and we're also going to do some kind of a um, elimination of water. I think I said transamination, not transamination. We're not transferring it to anything. It's a deamination. Sometimes my brain does things and I'm like, wait, did I say that right? Or did I say it wrong? Let me say it again and make sure that I say it right. So I'll say it a third time so that we have two times that are right. We're doing a deamination, which is just removal of an amino group. And then we're also removing a hydroxyl group through elimination. So the first step in this is abstracting a proton and we're going to eliminate this hydroxyl group as water. The next step is we've got our PLP. Oh, I didn't mention this. It uses PLP. So pretty much whenever we're talking about amino acid catabolism, just assume we're going to use PLP. So we're starting with PLP that is an external aldamine, which means that it is in con it is um, as part of the intermediate, and we're doing some chemistry. So that's where we're starting here. We've already formed our um, PLP serine compound, and now we're doing the chemistry. So once we eliminate that water, it gets rid of the hydroxyl group. We formed an intermediate. We can reverse the link to PLP. Once you do that, and you have rejoined the enzyme with its PLP, then rearrangement of the enamine that's formed by the addition of a proton can occur. And then you can have that hydrolytic deamination so water will just come in and attack this carbon. And now you've got pyruvate. This is a mechanism that you should be able to work through. So I'm not going to go over it in 100% detail. But make sure that you can um, draw this one. It should be very similar 
to the other PLP reactions that we've talked about. We've also got serine hydroxymethyltransferase. And that catalyzes the addition of a hydroxymethyl group to glycine to make serine. This actually uses tetrahydrofolate and PLP. I'm not going to require you to know this one. There's the glycine cleavage enzyme, and that will degrade glycine. It catalyzes the reversible oxidative cleavage of glycine to carbon dioxide, ammonium ion, and a methylene group. This uses tetrahydrofolate, and if you have issues with this, then you will end up making methylglyoxal, which can modify proteins in DNA, and that is bad. You do not want to be going around um, mutating DNA, modifying proteins, because you can mess up a lot of things. So defects in this enzyme are, are really bad. There's D-amino acid oxidase, which can catalyzes the conversion of glycine to glyoxalate, which is then oxidized to oxalate. And if you have a lot of this going on, it can actually account for kidney stone formation. So most kidney stones have some form of calcium oxalate, some amount of it in there. Here's some genetic defects that are caused um, by issues with amino acid metabolism. There are definitely some of these that are going to be covered when we have our little project and you do your presentations and submit your literature reviews. So I'm not going to go into detail for these and save it for the end. There's seven amino acids that are degraded to acetyl-CoA. Again, you don't need to memorize these. So you can directly make acetyl-CoA or you can make acetoacetyl-CoA, which can then be cleaved to make acetyl-CoA molecules. And this is just showing you that pathway for the different amino acids. Again, you don't need to memorize this. You don't even need to draw this. Just understand the concept. So tryptophan, in addition to it being just a super bulky, interesting amino acid, it has the most complex of all the pathways in amino acid catabolism. Because some of the intermediates for breaking down tryptophan are actually precursors for other biomolecules. So tryptophan is definitely involved in making neurotransmitters. It's a precursor of niacin, which is, or sorry, it's a precursor of NAD and NADP because you can form niacin. So it can do a lot. Tryptophan is a little bit extra, but it's probably because it's so useful in um, neurotransmitter generation and generating NAD and NADP. These are the pathways for phenylalanine and tyrosine. They get degraded into acetoacetyl-CoA and fumarate. And genetic pathways here can lead to heritable diseases as well. So there are some people who um, have defects that cause issues with neural development and there are intellectual deficits because of this so tryptophan phenylalanine we're talking about amino acids that contribute to the formation of neurotransmitters um, or antagonists so if you don't have those things then there can be some real issues with neural development not going to spend time talking about phenylketonuria because again this one's going to be covered as well but PKU, the abbreviation, is caused by a defect in phenylalanine hydroxylase. 
and you'll see elevated levels of phenylalanine in the blood, but it is treatable. Alcaptonuria is another disease that is caused by a defect in a dioxygenase. And so it actually turns your urine black. Um, a lot of these diseases are diseases that are screened for. They are very rare, but without immediate intervention, real damage can occur. So if you ever had a child or you know someone who has had a child, um, they may say something about a newborn screen. And that is when they prick the baby's foot and they draw blood and they submit that blood to be tested for a whole bunch of super rare metabolic diseases and things. Likely not going to have any issues, but it's really worth it for those few people who do have issues so their babies can get treatment immediately. Some amino acids are converted to alpha-ketoglutarate, which we already know is a really key molecule for a lot of these processes that we've already talked about, urea cycle and things like that. Glutamate can also get deaminated. That's like the simplest one to form alpha-ketoglutarate. Arginine degradation is part of the urea cycle. So alpha-ketoglutarate gets made simply by doing the urea cycle. I think that's pretty cool. You see how the chemistry of the cell has developed to where there's major overlap so that you're more efficient and you reduce your energy cost. So if you can get two things done with the same energy investment, then overall that puts you ahead of the game. We can make succinyl-CoA. That's an important intermediate of the citric acid cycle. And this is the pathway for that. Again, going through this a little bit quick because I'm showing you the chemistry. If you're interested, you can look at it, read about it, ooh ah. But I'm not going to require you to memorize all of these pathways. I just think that that's a bit above our pay grade and we don't have the time. I don't think that it is worth it to memorize these pathways when just understanding how they feed into the other more major pathways. I think that's more beneficial. So when you just talk about branched amino acids, like valine, isoleucine, these amino acids are not degraded in the liver. They're only degraded in the tissues outside of the liver. So muscle, adipose tissue, kidneys, the brain. The amino transferase to do this reaction is actually absent in the liver. And if you don't have the dehydrogenase complex that can metabolize these amino acids, then you'll end up with maple syrup urine disease. So the branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex catalyzes the oxidative decarboxylation of all three alpha keto acids and we make um, carbon dioxide and acyl coas It's regulated by covalent modification and it responds to your diet. So if you eat something that has protein that's got these branch chain amino acids, that's going to trigger a covalent modification. So when it's phosphorylated, it's inactive. When those phosphates are removed, it's active. This should sound very, very similar to other complexes that we have talked about. Think about those similarities. It'll help you. I'm not gonna go too deep into maple syrup urine disease because again, Lots of these diseases are going to be covered by your peers when we do the literature review and the presentations. But when you do not have the uh, branch chain alpha keto um, acid dehydrogenase complex, then you can have major issues. And you can treat this with rigid control of the diet, but I'm sure you know it's really hard to stick to a super strict diet. 
So this is, you know, this is definitely a problem for folks. Finally, we talk about asparagine and aspartate. They're degraded to make oxaloacetate. And we already talked about how aspartate can contribute to um, kind of the, the shunt pathway where we are providing some electron donors to the citric acid cycle along with intermediates to the citric acid cycle to offset the energetic cost of the urea cycle. So asparaginase catalyzes the hydrolysis of asparagine to aspartate. And then there's an aspartate aminotransferase where you can take aspartate and transfer its amino group to alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate and oxaloacetate. Thanks for watching. That's it for chapter 18. Make sure that you can draw similarities between the different cycles and pathways that we've covered and kind of get a feel for the repetition and chemical logic. That will definitely be helpful for you on the exam. Don't worry too much about understanding all of the different um, pathways that are used to take amino acids and degrade them, but understand the broad strokes that that can happen and the different intermediates that are made and how they can feed into other metabolic, metabolic pathways. So that's the overview for this one. PLP is really the thing that you need to know. So mechanisms that are using PLP, you should be able to reason out. Um, outside of that, just recognizing the other coenzymes because we'll see them again down the road. But again, not requiring you to memorize the structures of these things. You'll be provided with that on the exam. That's it for 18. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.